Yellow, welcome to Introduction to Poker Lecture 4. Right, there we go. Okay, so today we are doing opening ranges and steals. So if you remember, in Lecture 2, we did starting hand strength. We ranked it on gold, good pair potential, left potential versatility. And we talked about which to raise from under the gun. Uh, last lecture, lecture three, we went over a whole bunch of math that we're going to use today. And we're going to cover this math and review. First, uh, position, once again, uh, position's a huge deal because when we go last, we get more information. And then we also have the flexibility to decide, hey, do we want to raise? Do we want to bet? What do we want to do? Um, and when you go first, you don't have that flexibility because there are people after you that can put pressure on you and decide um, if they want to just check, let it go through, or, or raise and apply pressure. So flexibility is huge deal. When we raise from under the gun, uh, it's primarily for value. We have strong hands. When we have strong hands, we want to get money in the middle. It's also to thin the field. Uh, pocket aces is not nearly as good as four other people as it is against one person, and to sometimes win the blind. Um, we will cover all of these in more detail soon, and that soon is today um, because we're going to go over open raising from every other position. A big part of open raising from other positions is fold equity. Um, a lot of in later positions, we have more fold equity because we're going to get more folds because there's fewer people. Um, so it ends up incentivizing us to try to steal the blinds more often from the button than we might from under the gun. Uh, the combined probability um, is just a quick and dirty way for us to say, for us to guesstimate that from under the gun, people will fold 52% uh, of the time, will steal the blinds. But from the button, it could be up close to 80% of the time that our steal goes through, um, which is big enough to seriously motivate stealing. Now, pot odds is another formula that we're going to make use of today. Um, it is the ratio of the pot as it currently stands is our investment to see the next card. So uh, again, an uh, important distinction here is say the pot currently stands at 10 bucks, villain bets five. Now, because they bet five, the pot is $15. So plugging that into our pot odds formula, it's five over 15 plus five. So five over 20, 25%. Some people might make the mistake of instead doing five over 10 plus five, um, which would give you the wrong answer of 33. We, we add their bet to the pot and then do this formula. So default ranges from all positions, default opening ranges. So you've seen this one more than a few times now. Um, this is our default that we arrived at based on good pair potential, versatility, not potential. It's not rigid. We will adjust it. And this range chart, along with all the other ones we're going to show you, are on the conservative side of things, which we think is good for beginners. It's a good way. Um, it's better to start conservative and start to add more hands as you feel more comfortable with why we're raising hands, what we're doing, than it is to start playing too many hands and then get in a bad habit. Now, opening from the under the gun position to the hijack, you see we've started to add more hands. We've added king jack offsuit, ace 10 offsuit, all of the suited aces, nine eight suited, and uh, pocket sixes. And I think actually that 10 nine offsuit is not supposed to be lit up. Uh, oops, ignore that. Um, our goal in raising are still primarily for value and to thin the field. Um, under the gun is already folded, which thins it for us. Uh, so there's only four players left behind us. So we do expect more folds now. Um, because our raise gets to the whole field more often, we can add weaker hands that need this added fold equity to be profitable. They're not bad hands. Like when we raise ace nine suited and someone calls, we don't, it's not the end of the world. We're not sad about it. But we'd prefer if everybody folds. Like if we're when we're raising, it'd be nice to just get the blinds and be done with it. Um, yeah, we, we need that little bit of extra fold equity. Now, as we open from the cutoff, uh, we're starting to add some more hands now. Um, you see, we're playing a lot more now. We're playing all these extra pocket pairs, more of these suited connector type hands, that sort of thing. Um, yeah. Now we're adding weak hands with the hope that everybody folds. When we raise with pocket twos from the cutoff. We're not hoping to get calls. We're just hoping everyone folds and we can snag the blinds. When you raise with ace nine offsuit, we're not hoping that people call. We're hoping we can just snag the blinds. Um, we shouldn't get raise, get out of line and raise any two garbage cards as a steal. We should continue to consider this good pair potential, not potential versatility. Um, basically, like if we're gonna be stealing with some of our hands, why not steal with the best hands we'd otherwise be folding? If we would fold ace nine offsuit but we're gonna to decide to steal with it instead. Why would we steal with Jack four offsuit? 
Um, again, this is still somewhat conservative in practice. You might be playing more, uh, but this is very reasonable. Now, the button. This is the position from which we're going to be generating the most EV by far. Um, and a big mistake a lot of newer players make is not stealing wide enough from the button. Uh, it's crucial to steal aggressively. Now, there's only two players left to act, so full equity is huge. Uh, this point about reducing sizing, sorry, the slides are out of order. Uh, we're going to cover that in a few slides. But when you raise from the button, you only raise to 2.5, the big blind, to $5 instead of the $6. And we're going to cover why. But because we can do this for cheaper, um, it also incentivizes more stealing. Um, it's, it's, we only have to risk five to win the blind instead of to win six. We're also always in position post flop. We have position on the small blind and the button. So that's going to be a huge boost for EV post flop. And the third point is a bit trickier. On the button, ranges are wider. So it's easier to get a stronger hand. I think King Jack off, King Jack suited is a great example of this. Under the gun, King Jack suited is a dangerous hand to open raise. We still do it, but it's dangerous because there are five players left to go. If those five players have ace king, we're in trouble. If they have the, the suited ace version of this flush, we're in trouble. If they have ace jack, we might be in trouble if, if they we flop a jack. So it can be dangerous marginal pairs. But when we're opening from the button with king jack suited, there's only two players left to go. This is a great hand. Like they're not really going to have us dominated very often with something better. So the part of our range that can be considered strong value hands is bigger. So this is a default button open range. And again, don't get out of line and steal with garbage. Uh, it cannot be said enough. Don't just memorize this chart. Um, opening from the button especially is extremely dynamic. From If we're open raising from under the gun, we'll adjust a bit, we'll add hands, we'll get rid of hands, but we're mostly playing the same hands. The button, it's crazy how much shifting around there'll be. Uh, here we're raising 48% of hands. There might be situations where I'm raising 70% or I'm raising like 25% of hands. Um, yeah, so it's extremely dynamic and will change drastically. If there are nits or loose players, we'll cover what nits and loose players are soon if you're not familiar. And again, if, if you notice how we're picking these hands to open raise with, we're, we're playing all of the offsuit aces because they've got uh, now, because they've got good pair potential with the ace. Uh, we're playing our suited kings and our suited queens because they're versatile. Um, same thing with hands like seven, five suited it's for that versatility and a bit of that nut potential. Yeah, so it's, it's always a mix of the good pair potential and potential versatility factors. Now, opening from the small blind. If you notice, we're playing less hands. So here from the button, we had two players left to fold. Now we have one player left to fold and we're playing less hands. Uh, the big difference is here for the button, we're always in position post-flop. And then the small blind, we're always out of position post-flop. Huge problem. Um, incentivizes the big blind to call very lightly, to raise, to cause us pain. Um, so even though we're still stealing aggressively, but there's one person left, we actually open less hands, about 42% of hands. So let's quickly scroll through all of these. You can kind of see how it expands as we go from position to position. Do, 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 do. Yeah. So sizing slide that should have been a bit earlier. Uh, if you remember how we said the default should be three times, it should be to six bucks. From the cutoff button and small blind, uh, we should go down from 3x to 2.5x. Uh, the small blind is debatable. Uh, personally, I still like raising to 3x from the small blind. Some people like raising to, to 2.5. I prefer three from the small blind just because we're out of position. Let's make the big blind pay more. But so back to on topic, why from the button and the cutoff do we raise to five? Uh, the primary purpose of our raise is to steal the blinds it's not for value with strong hands so you don't care as much about building a pot so we just want to pay less to have the chance to steal the blinds um 2.5 is still a decent raise size um and if everyone folds um when we raise from the cutoff 68 percent of the time everybody will fold then by raising alone we just make one big blind in steals no matter what happens it's just free money which we love um and this really goes to show how much money we make by stealing if we even if when we're on a steal, we win like 25% of the time post-flop. Like that's enough to justify the steal right there. Um, what was the last point I want to make? Um, yeah, especially at low stakes with bad players, people are very bad at adjusting to changes in sizing. So they'll treat us raising to six bucks the exact same as us raising to five bucks. Nobody will even think about it. Um, 
In reality, it should make a big difference on how many hands they play because we're giving them better pot odds. Um, but it won't, they won't adjust for it. So this is a great way to exploitive, exploitatively raise less and get um, and still get the same amount of folds. Oh, last point, we don't switch our raise size depending on our purpose. So I don't say, oh, I want to steal, so I'll raise to $5. I want to raise for value, let's raise to $6. That's, uh, I'm sure you can guess why that's not very good. And then our opponents know, oh, they've got a value hand, or oh, they're stealing. We can't give away information like that. So we would open every single hand to $5. Let's us now get into player types. Long list. Um, fish are considerably weaker than average. Reg is a much more competent player. We'd say they're like at that given stake, that level we're playing. They're an average player. They're a good player. Uh, a shark or a crusher, very strong player, winning quite a bit on average. We want to be a shark. We want to be a crusher. Um, whales and mega fish. If you sit down at a table with a whale, you're not leaving until they leave. We want their money. Uh, Nit is a player who is passive and folds too much in general, especially pre-flop. Um, it could be possible, like, Nits can be aggressive once they make their hand. They can start to go crazy, but it'll be they play one out of every 20 hands, then the one hand they do get, they start going crazy. Otherwise, they'll fold very easily versus aggression. Uh, loose players call too many hands, play too many hands. Tight players call in frequently and instead opt to raise or fold. Uh, passive players are not nearly aggressive enough uh, with betting and raising, and then they'll overcall. So they'll just go call, call, call down to the river with their middle pair. Um, and aggressive players apply lots of pressure by frequently betting and raising. So not all of these are bad qualities to have. Um, there's actually some of this list that we want to be other than shark crusher. So take a guess. There's two of them that we want. All right. We want to be the tight and aggressive players, tag players. Tag players play strong hands pre-flop and bet dash raise a lot more often than they flat call. By taking the stance of aggressor with a strong selection of hands, we can put pressure on villain and get them to call and we have strong hands or bluff and get them to fold and we have weak hands because we're, we're representing so many strong hands that if we just keep the pressure up when we're weak, we can get some folds. Uh, at the exact same time, we protect ourselves from getting bullied because when we're playing strong hands when we're the aggressor and we're not calling as often, uh, it's harder for people to put pressure on us. Um, there are situations where we'll play very differently to attack villain. So if our villain is just god awful terrible and we want to play against loose players, uh, then we're incentivized to overcall. Um, yeah, sorry, give me a sec. Um, yeah, so wait, hold on. <laughs> about that, I'll restate because I kind of got distracted going outside my room. Um, yeah, say someone's like, like a mega whale, terrible player. Uh, we want to play pots with mega whales that will give us their money. So in those situations, we might be incentivized to be very loose and just call like every hand hoping to get lucky. Uh, it could be there's a certain player we don't want to make mad. Uh, they're, they're a mega whale that's great for the action, but they hate when we keep betting, betting, and being annoying. So we might play more passive to make them stay friendly and not want to leave. But we almost always just want to focus on playing good poker tag style. So VPIP preflop raise. So we covered these uh, previous lectures, just quick refresher. Preflop raise is the percentage of the time we raise and we can preflop. We want this number to be about 19% for six max Texas Hold'em. VPIP is the percentage of hands that we willingly play. And we want that to be about 23%. Uh, so we should be open raising more than we call. Uh, that only leaves 4% for calling raises if 19% of the 23 that we percent of hands that we play should be raises. So heads up displays, if you remember from last lecture, uh, just a collection of information about that we get by each hand we've played so far. So the key point is that it takes a lot of hands for the statistics, the HUD tracks to become accurate. Um, it's if it's a VPIP is percentage of hands we play out of total hands, we've only been 10 total hands. The statistic isn't accurate at all. Uh, Part of the reason that VPIP and preflop raise are some of the most popular statistics for use in poker is because they become accurate very quickly. After 10 hands, um, if they're running a 60-10, they're probably a fish. A 25-25, probably a good player. 50 is okay. Um, I Pretty reliable idea of rough player type. Like at this point, I can say, okay, who's the fish? Who's the net? Yada, yada, yada. Uh, 100 is decent. Um, very close to the truth, 
They could still have five percentage points plus of variability, but we got a good idea of how they play. 200 is good. 500 is like perfect. We, we've got an accurate image. So this is the fastest convergence statistic and it still takes 500 hands to be like dead on um, and about a hundred for us to be comfortable with it. So we can classify player types based on VPIP-PFR. So you're gonna see this a lot this semester. We're gonna say, we're gonna say that a player is a 1915 player, 19 slash 15. So what does that actually mean? Uh, it's their VPIP and then their preflop razor percentages. And you're not, don't go through and memorize every single one of these. Um, what's more important is kind of understanding how we're getting, like how we're getting these by general rules. If there is a huge gap between the VPIP and the preflop raise, that means they call way more than they raise, which means they're passive. If you notice every big gap is a passive player. Uh, small gaps still raise a lot. So they, they're, not, they're not passive necessarily. Um, when we're considering small gaps, it's back to, okay, is their preflop raise really low? Their VPIP really low? Oh, then they're a nit. If it's about where we want them to be, then oh, they're a good player. If their preflop raise is way too high, then oh, they're an aggro player, they're an aggro fish, an aggro whale. Um, Ill-timed aggression, um, very punishable. As for the kind of opponents we like the most, we really like playing against aggro fish, aggro whales. Those will make us the most money on average because they're the ones who are pouring money in the middle. Nits, let's just kind of sit there and go check, call, fold. Maybe they bet small. Aggro players will just be going wild. So we way prefer these kind of players to exploit. Yeah, VPIPs below 19 are nits, preflops above 25s are too aggressive, below 15 to uh, 14 to 15 are passive. So what about live poker? I'm sure a lot of you are thinking, well, these are just numbers on a computer screen. What happens if I actually go to play real people in poker? Uh, we do exactly the same player classification in person, uh, but it's much rougher. We're just estimating our statistics based off our appearance. So I don't say, oh, they're running a VPIP of 50, but I do say, wow, that guy's playing way too many hands. He just calls every time. But then I don't really see him get aggressive. He just kind of gives up and folds or just goes call, call. All right, lose passive fish. Um, lose player types are much, much more useful than tells. In the movies, it's you look at somebody and you see how their arm quivers when they bluff, so I can use that against them in the future. In reality, it's way more useful to just see what hands they play, how they play, and then go, oh, they call too many hands, so I can exploit that by getting strong hands and then bullying them with my strong hands. Uh, that's the real big exploit that we care about. So takes us into steals and dynamic adjustments. So what I'm happy about is you can actually read this. When I presented this in class, uh, this slide was completely illegible because of the color. <laughs> it looked great when I was making it, or it looked okay. Not a huge fan of the color scheme, honestly, but it was readable. So uh, a steal is a preflop raise with the near sole intention of winning the blinds. We're not raising for value to thin the field. Well, kind of, we're thinning the field to steal the blinds. We're, we're raising because we want the blinds. Um, before we talk more, talk more about steals, we need to cover required fold equity. Uh, it is the mathematically required success rate of a steal to break even. So if you remember for pot odds, it was, it was the required success rate of a call to break even. Here, it's a required success rate of a steal. So if we're risking R to take down the pot and the amount that we stand to win is PG, required full equity is R over PG plus R. Uh, so the thing here is that uh, in this case, I don't, we don't add it to the pot because we're not concerned about winning our own money back. But anyway, yeah, we stand to win PG plus R and this is the formula we get out. It also applies to bluffs. So a steal is basically a pre-flop bluff, right? So post-flop or all the way up to the river, we need, if our RFE is 60%, our bluff needs to work 60% of the time for it to be justified. Once again, similarly to pot odds, um, there's a bit of nuance we ignore, but here's a quick example. Um, we generally know, because we've talked about it, that open raising as a steal to four big blinds is too large. Our default is three, we even go down to 2.5 from the cutoff. But why? Let's check with RFE. If we plug in risk four, and we're, we're winning the blinds in the pot, you need an RFE of 72.7% to justify this steal. Um, by our previous math on combined probability, our fold equity is about 68% from the cutoff. 
Uh, so we don't have the fold equity for a steal. Uh, when you raise to 2.5 big blinds, we have about the same fold equity. Again, this might not be the case if their opponents are really good. In practice, nobody ever acts differently versus five big blinds and versus six big blinds. So it makes the steal profitable. So factors affecting steals. You're going to see a lot of slides shaped like this over the semester with the, the green boxes. Um, and all it ever really is, is common sense, like what makes sense, just basic logical level, and then we're just formalizing that. So good factors, hand has more good pair potential than potential and versatility. Well, we'd want to play better hands. If like, if we are, even if we're going for a steal, when they call, we want our hands to be good because sometimes they'll call. So it's better to have a good hand. Um, tight three betters ahead. So we haven't covered this terminology yet, but if we raise and get re-raised, that's known as a three bet. Um, we prefer if the players are much less likely to three bet us because if we steal, and then get three bet, we have to fold, which is no fun. If we just get called, we can still win the pop post flop. Um, and the last few factors I'd say, especially just, okay, common sense. We like to bluff more when it's more likely that our bluff will work. We like to bluff more when it's more likely our opponents won't notice we're bluffing or they're just bad players. So yeah, not too bad. So here is where the math meets reality for required fold equity. We've talked about this with pot odds, but the nuance RFE ignores is that it assumes that every time our opponents call, our steal doesn't work and they call our bet, we just lose instantly on the spot. And we, that's not the case in reality at all. We still could win like 30, 40, 50 even percent of the time. Um, or we could still bluff, take down the pot, that sort of thing. So we are doing much better than required fold equity will tell us. So here's a general rule as a starting point. It's variable, adjusts on factors listed later. Uh, but when factors are neutral, we need five to 10% less fold equity than required fold equity. So all of that math out of the way, it's time to get into actual steel ranges. Okay, so loose passive fish hunting from under the gun. So if it's highlighted in green, that's a hand we'd normally raise from under the gun anyway. Uh, it's highlighted, yeah, white, that means it's a hand that we're dynamically opening, or it might be a hand that we are now folding instead. So We've added it to our open range because we think that our opponent's weak. So here, say in the big blind, there's a very weak player, VPIP key for uh, PFR of 5612. That means they're passive and loose. We really want to play pots with this person. Um, if we get heads up with them, we can extract a bunch of money. So a lot of opens now become plus EV. So we add hands with good pair potential and up potential. Why? Uh, we want hands that can make huge hands to extract value. So we on those factors decide to add. So pocket twos through sixes, not potential. Suited aces, not potential. Ace 10, king jack, not potential. I mean, good pair potential, sorry. So we have those. Now, hijack, say there's, if there's a fish in the blinds again, and again, the reason we care if they're in the blinds is so then we have position on them post flop. If there's a fish, it's the same thing. We like playing pots with fish because they'll call our bets and we'll make money and they're bad. Um, so that makes us add more hands. Now, what about if our player is a knit? They fold way too much. Well, then that still makes us play more hands because we have more fold equity. Um, so we want to steal more often. We can get away with playing worse hands. So it's for completely different reasons. But against a fish, we play more hands. And against a knit, we play more hands. The difference is, is in one, we have more implied odds. In other is we have more fold equity. So here, once again, because we care about our implied odds, we add the pocket twos through fives uh, to our dynamic opening range. And then we added some suited hands like jack nine suited, 10 eight suited that can also make straights. So yeah, quick jargon, we covered it. A three bet is a raise over an existing raise. If we raise and get re-raised, that's a three bet. A three bet that gets re-raised is a four bet and so on. Key point highlighted in blue. We really hate it when we're trying to steal and then we get three bet and have to fold. If we get called, we can still win post flop. If we have to fold, we just lose three big blinds right there. Uh, if you remember, we mentioned, I think in the first lecture that a very good win rate for poker uh, is 10 big blinds every 100 hands. So let's say we raise to 2.5, we get three bet and have to fold. If that happens four times every 100 hands, that's not that rare. One out of every 25 hands, let's say this happens, our win rate goes to zero. Like it's a huge problem 
that if we try to steal and then get three bet, so we hate it. If we just get called, uh, then we can still win post flop. We still are a huge percentage of the time we'll take down that pot. That's a lot of expected value that we lose and we get three bet. So because of this, if we're facing someone who three bets us a lot, we actually have to fold more hands. It's nice. It's really nice playing players that are bad that let us play more hands. Uh, and a lot of times we have to play fewer hands. Um, not profitable at all to having to fold regularly. So what we do is we, we start to go back to hands that can defend better. So we take off like pocket sixes. Um, we take off the ace six through eight suited because uh, they just don't have very good defense against a three bet range. If they have an ace king, we're in trouble. You might ask, well, wait, why are we playing ace five, four, three, two suited? Why not ace six suited? This looks weird. Uh, the key point is that ace five suited can make straights uh, as well. It can make ace two, three, four, five. And a pair of sixes is not better than a pair of fives in practical terms. It's not like going to be a deciding factor almost ever. So that makes the ace five actually a better hand because of this. Um, yeah, we should open less and we expect to be three bet more often. We have to tighten up to be able to defend. Sadly, most of us are very young. Um, and when you go to a casino as a young person around, say, 21, even younger, uh, there will always be some old people there who want to bully you because they see you as like, oh, just a dumb kid with some money or they got scared money. This $200 that they bought in for is their yearly salary working at McDonald's. They should be scared to lose it. So they just, they just try to like shit test you basically and will three bet you like crazy. Uh, it's a, you'll encounter this all the time. So unfortunately, we'll a lot of times we'll have to tighten up to defend. Personally, when you have a tight, uh, a light three better directly behind you, it starts cutting into your win rate in general because then it's harder to exploit other weak players at the table. So we got to play fewer hands. We have to deal with their aggression. And it's also just annoying and uncomfortable. It's not profitable or good that they're doing it, but the way we have to adjust to defend is not fun. So a lot of times I'll just move tables or even just switch seats. If I can just get to a different seat at the table where the person three betting is, goes before me now instead of goes after me, then that's a lot better. So cut off hunting range, same thing. Uh, we like it if there are fish behind us, especially if they're in the blinds. Fish in the blinds means we'll have position on the weaker player post flop, which lets us go more wild. When we have position, we can bluff like crazy, or we can just go bet, bet, bet with our good hands. When we're out of position, it's not as nice. And again, just kind of keep, keep track of why we're adding the hands we do. Against these weak player in the blinds, we like our good pair potential and we like our nut potential. So we add in our suited hands up here and we add in our ace two through eight offsuit because pair base is pretty good, that sort of thing. And here's my personal favorite. From the buttons and knit, uh, we can start to treat the cutoff as a second button and steal very aggressively. The button is by far the most profitable position in poker. And we love it. So then we love it when the button's in it because basically every single orbit rotation of the blinds, we get two turns on the button, which is great. We love it. And if you notice, compare. So, so here we're hunting versus fish. We add some more hands. Uh, it's, it's a pretty big amount, but it's not crazy. And here it's just like, wow, we're, we're playing like 100 more hands, uh, combinations of hands, which we'll cover later because we love it when they're in it. And same thing here when we're facing light three betters. We have to tighten up and remove hands to defend. Um, key point is that we have to defend more hands when the light three better is on the button because they have position post flop. If we're on the cutoff and the button three bets us pre, then post flop they have position. If we're on the cutoff and the big blind three bets us, well, we have position post flop, so we can call with more hands. If they're trying to get sneaky and steal and mess with us, they might be in some dicey waters. So we like that. So what about if there's more than one player type? There's not just a knit or a fish, there's all sorts of people. Uh, the reality is this is almost always it's gonna be happening and there is no one answer. Uh, poker is dynamic and it's up to your best judgment. Um, so there, I, the way I kind of do it, at least as I'm playing is I say, okay, so this aggressive person behind might apply pressure, but I really wanna play pots with this fish in the big blind. So, you know what, I will play more hands. I will, I will get a bit out of line here. And then if the aggressive player starts fighting me back and putting pressure, I say, okay, I have to tighten up. And it's, it goes back to that game theory optimal finding an equilibrium thing where you should try to think about critically, okay, what do I want to accomplish here? Am I willing to risk? Maybe I get bullied by this aggressive player. Um, maybe 
I don't get the the full equity that I want, and then you can you can you can start to get into a good rhythm as you play. All right, fold to button open and three bet percentage. So these are two more HUD stats we're gonna do, like the pip and preflop raise. Uh, I will say preemptively, fold to button open is a conceptual thing we're teaching because it's a, it's a good concept to understand. Um, I don't ever use this in practice ever. Three bet percentage, also very useful conceptually, but uh, you use it like everywhere in practice. This is definitely the third most useful HUD statistic. Um, I love this. It's, it's a really great idea for getting a, a perception of how aggressive someone is and how much you can get away with stealing. So fold versus button open. It is the percentage of the time the player folds when someone open raises from the button. Uh, we use this stat to approximate fold equity uh, to decide whether or not to attempt to steal. Um, in practice, what I do, I don't, I never am sitting there calculating my fold the button open, but I will notice, hey, big blind folds every time I raise. All right, let's raise more. Small blind folds, they don't have three, but let's raise more. Um, yeah, so in practice, I've never used the fold button open percentage on my tracker, but I've stolen aggressively versus nits, where I've just said, okay, this guy folds too much, time to go crazy. Uh, here's our reliability chart. Uh, 50 hands is bad. Like we still can't get a good idea after 50 hands played if they really fold too often. Uh, 200 is a decent flavor. After a decently long session, I start noticing, wow, this, this guy folds a lot when I raise from the button. And then good, uh, 500 and excellent. Like we have a very strong idea of 1,000 hands. And interpretation of all this is this is still one of the faster converging stats and it takes 1,000 hands for it to converge reasonably. So live poker, you'll be very lucky, and it just doesn't happen often to get 40 hands an hour. That's very rare. So it would take 25 hours of play to get to an excellent point, and it would take five hours of play to get to a good, oh, no, five hours of play to get to a decent understanding. Uh, it'll be the third stat noted in green. Uh, we're not really going to see it after this lecture. For now, it'll just keep, uh, keep mine as noted in green. Um, the key point to how long it takes for the stat to converge is that you can get a good idea by seeing what hands they played at showdown. If I see villain called with 8-4 offsuit, I know that they are way over calling in the, in the big blind. Uh, they are extremely loose players that don't fold versus opens. Meanwhile, it's a bit harder to tell if they're folding too much, but sometimes they might fold and show their, their ace jack and you're just like, what? Or you just might say, hey, they don't play any hands. Um, let's give us a good idea that they're a knit. So hand history. I'm going to talk through these steps. So first, what is our required fold equity? Again, in practice, we're not going to calculate our RFE. Uh, I don't ever do this in practice. What I might do is have a rough and dirty approximation where I say, I know that an RFE of a min open is 57%. Uh, and I know that I'm, they're probably going to fold 60%. Okay, I'm good. Um, in reality, it's more of, of to give you the concept that smaller sizes need lower required fold equity, larger bet sizes need more required fold equity. So let's plug it in. Two over 1.5 plus two, 57%. So now what is our fold equity using fold to button open? So the idea is we need both the small blind and the big blind to fold. So we multiply their numbers together. We do 76% times 83%. So they fold 63% of the time. So think about it. We need them to fold 57% for the steal to be profitable. In reality, they fold 63%. Okay, it's profitable. We raised to two. Takes us into our next statistic, which is much more useful. It is the number of times a player has three bet out of the opportunities they have had to do so. So if I go first, if I'm under the gun, I don't have the option to three bet unless someone else, like I, I raise and someone else raises behind me or I limp and someone else raises behind me, that sort of thing. So it, remember it's out of the opportunities that you have to three bet, not just out of your total hands. Yeah, very important stat. Um, and in, oh yeah, I should have changed this. In practice, if we can't, uh, I should have changed the description of this one. And, and we do use the stat when we play online a lot. And in practice, again, when you just can feel like this person's three betting too much. This is crazy. Like they, it seems like just too often. I feel like they're being aggressive. They're kind of trying to bully me here. And you can tell, yeah, just ignore the, the third point on the slide here. Sorry, I should have fixed that. Um, so reliability, again, the reliability is just, it takes an insane number of hands, 300 to be decent. 
um, a thousand to be excellent. And the point is that you have fewer opportunities to three bet than you do to just decide whether to play a hand preflop. So it takes more hands to get a good sample size. Yeah. So yeah, I never use fold the button open, but three bet percentage is invaluable. So we want to aim, I'd even argue probably on the higher end of the three bet percentage. So here it says six to nine is average. Uh, against bad players, they will overcall versus three bets. So we're more incentivized to three bet with our strong, stronger hands. Uh, which means we should be on the high end of average or maybe even into the, the high range. Um, I have a reputation for being three bet crazy when I play poker. Uh, my numbers still say that I'm mostly okay, but I, when I play with people, they joke, but why are you always three betting? Uh, <laughs> and if someone hits uh, 12 to 15 or 16 plus even, like they're just insane, they're three betting garbage, they're crazy. It's annoying to play against, but we love them because when they're this aggro, they're going to just dump money to us. And if a player has like a one to three three bet, you, they're really only three betting their pocket aces. Beware, be careful. So here, first take a look at the numbers. Um, they're folding um, a decent amount of the time on the button. We said that around 66% is reasonable. So the reg is folding a reasonable amount. The knit is folding too often. We expect that they're a knit. Now, if you look at the three bet percentages, they're both pretty low. The big blind is not three betting very often and the small blind is really not three betting very often. So remember that when we try to steal, we like it when we, we don't get three bet because we don't get three bet. Even when we get called, we can win the pot post flop. We either win by making the best hand or we could win by bluffing because we're in position. Um, so here, RFE still 57%. If we do 80 times 64, we get that our fold equity is 51.2%. But so so looking at this, then we shouldn't open our RFE. We need them to fold 57, but they're only folding 51.2. Oh man, we can't open. But what other information do we have? They don't three bet. So we can steal wider than RFE would suggest. Yeah, because even when we do get called, it's not the end of the world. When our steal doesn't work, we're still chilling. If they had high three bet percentages, they're gonna three bet a lot. And then it sucks when our steal doesn't work. So we can raise. And at number three, look at the, the passive fish in the big blind. Uh, they never fold. They 32% fold the button open. That's nuts. But good news is, is they never three bet. They three bet 3% 3 of the time. So if we raise, we almost are guaranteed to go heads up with passive fish post flop, which we want to do. We like playing pots in position against passive fish. What about the reg? Well, it says the reg is going to fold 82% of the time to our open. And the three bet percentage is a six, which is like the very low end of average. So like that's a, we're not too worried about them, especially because they're in the small blind. And so they're disincentivized to play as many hands. So here, our RFE is still uh, 57%. It's going to be the same thing for our, for our open. Um, our fold equity is 26%. So here, we are 30% below what we should be needing to steal. But we're nowhere close to RFE. However, our hand is suited. We can make a pair of queens and we wanna play pots with this passive fish post flop. So we can steal way wider than RFE would suggest. And we decide to open. And here actually we wouldn't go for three big, two big ones. We'd go for three because we really wanna charge the passive fish and start building the pot. So facing regs. So if you remember from our range chart, you probably don't, but this is in like a default environment where everything is nice and in our favor. A6 offsuit is a very clear open raise from the button versus small and big. Uh, but here, let's look at our player types. They're both regs. They don't fold too often versus our raise. They still fold 77% and 70, which is, they're kind of high, but they're pretty reasonable. The 77 may be a bit high, but whatever. But look at those three bet percentages, 12 and eight. 12 is at like the lower end of, of crazy. It's like, it's like high, very high, too, too high above average. And 8% is a very reasonable, strong three bet number. So our RFE is 53%, or no, our, our full equity is 53% and our RFE is 57. So we're only a few percentage points off this deal being justified by RFE. The problem is, is in those other scenarios where we said, ah, we're close enough, we'll do it anyway. There were factors in our favor. 
here, factors are against us. Opponents are strong and they three bet often. So can we steal wider? Only in neutral conditions. This isn't neutral. Uh, we can either fold or raise depending on how comfortable we feel playing them post flop. For me, probably a fold just because like I'm going to get three bet a lot and then I'll have to fold my A6 offsuit. I can just wait for a better opportunity. Final stat. So because I talked fast, I got to this here. I never got to it to the in-person lecture. And again, this is a statistic that we're not going to be using really through the semester um, or in our HUD. It's just a conceptual thing. I will say this statistic is actually a lot, lot more important than um, the fold the button open. So let's talk about it now. Don't worry if it doesn't make sense. So a continuation bet, also known as a C bet, is a bet made by the pre-flop raiser after the flop. Sometimes it's a bluff, sometimes it's for value. Um, but for now, it measures the percent of the time that it they have folded when they had the opportunity to do so. We really like it if they are straightforward and fold when they don't make a strong hand, because then we can just steal more. If they don't make a hand, we bluff and win. If they do make a hand and then they call, we say, okay, I give up. You've got something good. And we, we, we lay our foot off the gas. And a lot of statistics for today, don't worry about this. Just kind of get, try to get the gist. So here's the numbers for fold to flop CBET. And again, you're not supposed to really memorize these. Just get the idea that about a 50 is average. We want to fold to about half of continuation bets made against us. And we, other people should be folding about half the time. And it takes 3,000 hands <laughs> to get a good idea. Um, this takes over 40 hours of play online. In person, this will take you at least 70 hours, probably closer to 100. Let's go live poker. So, examples. So, again, let's look at the players. This hand, very bad. We don't like 7 3 of clubs, but we might want to steal with it. So, it is suited, which is nice. We have some implied odds there. Now, small blind is a knit. They fold 92% of the time, they don't three bet, but if you notice, their fold to flop C bet is 34, which means that when they have a good hand, um, then they're going to just stick with it. Like, sometimes statistics can be conflicting. Say the knit only plays pocket aces, then they'd have a 92% fold to C bet to button raise. They'll have a 2% three bet, yada, yada. But then post flop, they seem to never want to fold the bets. Why? Well, they've only got really strong hands by the time they get post flop. So keep that in mind. Um, factors kind of interact with each other. Now, small blind is not a factor because the knit is just going to fold almost every time. Let's look at the big blind. Uh, they have a 54% fold the button open, which is pretty low. Uh, we're very likely to get into a pot with them post flop. They have a 0% pre flop raise and a 36% B pip. So these guys, this guy is super passive, going to call bets, um, not be aggressive, and 2% three bet, not be aggressive, not going to raise, and 65% fold the flop C bet. So that's way above the 50 we said we wanted to aim for. So essentially, if we think about this raise, the knit is out of the equation. The fish is probably going to call, but when they call, we have a bunch of fold equity post flop. We have some implied odds and we can pretty much expect to never face aggression. So that's enough to justify the call. Slam dunk open. We're not trying to even get fold equity pre flop, although it is nice. Uh, fold equity post flop is a big deal. Um, because it's 65% of the time they fold. We open. And again, you go bigger to punish fish. We talked about this vacuum EV versus long-term EV. Quick refresher. It could be good in this one instance, but then because our opponents are good, they learn to adjust. Here's an example. 8-2 offsuit. Pretty much second worst hand in poker close to it. This would be a pure steal. By our fold the button open, they fold 57% of the time. Well, our RFE of a min steal is 57%. So we should just steal, right? Like it's 57, 57, 57. But what about the 1% of the time they call and the flop comes 882? That then we win, right? So we should totally raise. Well, the answer is no. Our opponents are aware regs. They're gonna be willing to adjust their strategy. Yeah, it's plus EV in a vacuum, but just barely. If we're raising this hand, then we're raising 100% of our hands. And then the regs will notice. They're like, they're raising every single time on the button. And they'll start 
trying to fight back, push our buttons, and they'll start three betting us aggressively. So we fold. Here's revisiting the factors. I'm just going to leave the slide open for a sec. I hope more of them make more sense now. And yeah, so for today's playing session, which again, you don't have, but good stuff to think about. Um, we, we have way less fold equity than usual when we play against bad people. All this stuff about steals, honestly, barely applies if you're playing low stakes live one two because they just never fold we have way less fold equity so this we should still steal absolutely but this disincentivizes stealing um especially when we're not playing for real money in the class people are going to be more inclined to call it the, like like random garbage don't limp do not limp i keep seeing limpers don't do it um raised to three times so like we raised six bucks under the gun hijack and then raised to five bucks from cutoff and button all right, that's it. Bye.